Sion. Janam jana salakaya. Chaksuran militangi natas mai sri gurve namaha. Vijay tannamano vistam stadidangi na bhutale. Vayam rupam kadamaya dadanti svapadanti kam. First of all, I offer my humble obeisances at the lotus feet of my Diksha and Shiksha Guru Nityulila Parishwam Vishnu Pada Satarasata Sisima Srila A. C. Bhakti Vinata Swami Prabhupada. And then I offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of my Shiksha and Sanyas Guru. Nityulila Parishwam Vishnu Pada Satarasata Sisima Srila. Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. I offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of the Shri Rupa, of, of my two Shiksha Gurus, Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pada Satara Satasi Simad, Shula Gaur Govinda Goswami Maharaj, and Shula Bhakti Vigyan Bharti Goswami Maharaj. And I offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of the Sri Rupa Nuga Guru Varga, Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Goswami Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Dev Goswami Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Thakur Prabhupada, Srila Gaur Kishore Das Babaji, and Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And I offer my humble obeisances unto the feet of all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis who are present here today, my Dandavat Pranam. So, I was very fortunate, I'll tell that story eventually in the course of the talk tonight, to be ordered by Srila Prabhupada to stay with Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj. And I lived with him for three years in Bhuvaneshwar in a small mother. And living there, I, in, 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 the, in the room with him on a daily basis, having his personal association, he told me many things about his life and about how he came to the meet Srila Prabhupada, etc. So I'll relate some of those stories which he personally told me. He told me that he was born in a very great Vaishnava family. There was uh, his father was in the lineage from Shamananda and uh, Ra Ra Ranganath or Radhan. Who was Shamananda's disciple? Huh? Ranga Devi? Ranga, no, Ranga. Uh, anyway. So he was in that lineage from Shamananda Goswami. So his father took initiation in that Sampradaya. There was a Sampradaya coming from Shamananda and uh, gradually it was throughout Orissa, just like Srila Naratam Das Thakur preached all over Bengal and made disciples. So Srila uh, Shamananda preached in Orissa and he made many disciples. And he had a lineage, a Sampradaya lineage. And Srila Gorgavanda Maharaj's father and his family were initiated in that line. And uh, his mother, her, I think it was her grandfather, had some connection with 
to the, this Gopal Jew temple. The Gopal Jew temple was started by one great uh, Vaishya. He was a very wealthy, learned person. And uh, the deity came to his son from Vrindavan, one Babaji brought that deity. And so, There's a story that when he was a small boy, his uncle told the story that Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj was running around outside the temple, a small boy, like these boys. And he was playing with one boy. And the two of them were running and making noise and laughing and joking like this. And when the uncle shouted at them that you stop making so much noise, they ran in the temple. So he went, the uncle went into the temple after them. And when he went in, he only saw Gorgo Vindamar. He where, where, where is the other boy? And he pointed to the altar. He said, he's there. <laughs> So from a very young age he was, Prabhupada said that he was a pure devotee from birth. So there was uh, the Panchasaka, five friends. They were followers of Lord Chaitanya, not the disciples because Mahaprabhu didn't initiate anybody. But they were followers of uh, Lord Chaitanya. One of them was named Jagannath Das. So Jagannath Das, he was just like uh, this uh, Tulsi Das. Tulsi Das translated the Ramayan from uh, Sanskrit into Hindi so that the public could read it. Because prior to that, if people wanted to read any scripture, they had to go to a temple and pay some donation to the Brahmin, then the Brahmin would read this scripture in Sanskrit and explain it in the local vernacular. So the public didn't have direct access to the books, to the teachings. The Tulsidas wrote the Ramayan, translated it from Sanskrit into Hindi, and Jagannath Das translated the Srimad Bhagavatam from Sanskrit into Odia. So that the Jagannath Das's uh, Bhagavad is called Jagannath's Bhagavad. <laughs> so in every village, everywhere in Orissa, there's a Bhagavat Stali. It means a small hut. And in that hut, there's an altar, and on that altar, there's one Jagannath Bhagavad. And every day, they read from the Bhagavad. So, Borgovinda Maharaj talked about how his father was a reader, and he used to read every day from Srimad Bhagavatam some verses. And he would read a few verses every day, so that in the course of one year, the whole Bhagavatam was read. So he said from his birth, he was hearing Bhagavad, being read every day by his father. And uh, until when he was, I think, 16 or 17, his father expired. So then he was without a father. His mother told that when Gorgovinda Maharaj was a child, he would weep at night. He didn't want to go to sleep. So she would give him the Bhagavatam. Then he would embrace the Bhagavatam and he'd become peaceful and fall asleep. 
people. From his childhood, there was this deep connection with Srimad Bhagavatam and with the pastimes of Krishna. After that, he went to college. Uh, in college, he studied uh, English language, English medium, but he studied English uh, as a, the major subject with a minor in Sanskrit. So he knew how to speak uh, Bengali, Oriya, Hindi, English, and Sanskrit, five languages. He was a very learned person. Then he, he told me one day, I said, from things that you have told me about your life, I could understand you had no inclination to get married. Why you got married? So he said to me, because my mother told that your father has died and you are the eldest son, so you must get married and become the head of the family. So according to Vedas, what the mother says we have to do, we have to follow it. And uh, so, by the order of my mother, I got married. I said, okay, but you had no inclination to get married. Why did you have seven children? He said, because every time my wife, according to Vedas, if the wife asks for a child, you have to give her. So every time my wife would ask me for one child, I gave her. So then it hit me and I said, that means you only had relations with your wife to have children? He said, yes, I had seven children and I passed semen seven times in my life. So just complete Grihastha Brahmachari, perfect Brahmachari. So this is for people here in the West, that is inconceivable. <laughs> but he was that kind of person, complete control of his senses. Mm. Then he used to teach in the school. And He went on Parikram at one time, after some years of teaching in the school. He was in his late forties. He went on Parikram and when he came back, he stopped, he couldn't teach English anymore. He just kept talking about Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> so then because of that, they had reprimanded him a little bit that you have to teach the subject matter. So then in the middle of the night he packed everything and he left. He told me, he said, I left and I went to another village and I stayed there near the, there was a temple there, so I stayed in that temple. He said, I knew everyone will come there to argue with me, that you have to go back to your family. But I refused. And then after I defeated them, I left. So he said, it is stated in Shastra that, the, he said, I changed my name. My name was Brajabandhu. I made my name Gorgopal because I wanted two things. I wanted Gore, Mahaprabhu, and I wanted Gopal. Right. And so I changed my name and I decided to go looking for the, that sadhu who could provide me with 
the understanding of Guru Bhagavan. But he said in 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 uh, Vedic literature it says before you take sannyas you should visit the four dams. The four dams are Haridwar, Puri, Dwarka, and Rameshwar. He said, so I went to Himalaya first. And I met, he says, I met so many yogis and sadhus and I talked with them. But none of them understood about Guru Bhagavan. They had their own ideas. He said, then I went to Vrindavan. So in Vrindavan, every day I was going from place to place taking bhiksha. Different temples were feeding the sadhus. So he was going to different temples and eating something. Once a day he would have a meal. So what happened was, he told, that uh, one day somebody told me, oh, you should go there to Raman Reti. In Raman Reti, there is uh, the Videshis. Videshi means foreigners. <laughs> the Videshi temple is there. there. Those foreigners are feeding every day, Kichli. So he went there to eat. So while he was there, they gave him a BTG in Hindi. So he started reading the BTG of Prabhupada. Either Hindi or English, I don't remember which language it was in. I think it was English. There was no Hindi yet at this point. So he was reading it, the magazine, and he was reading Prabhupada's lecture on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all of this. Then he became enthralled. Oh, this is my goal. He could understand. So he asked them, can I meet with the Prabhupada? Is he here? Yes, he's here, but you can't meet with him. Because he, he was living like one of these sadhus that are roaming in the road. He had his hair was all long and matted and his clothes were disheveled. And, so they thought, oh, he is just some sadhu, some guy. The devotees didn't have proper understanding of him. So he was looking around, looking around. He came to understand where Prabhupada's room was. So he stood at some distance where he could see inside to see when nobody was there. Then he walked in the room. So when he walked in the room, Prabhupada asked who he was. He told them. They had a discussion. Prabhupada, whenever he meets someone, says, oh, who are you? What is your name? What do you do? What was your work? You know, like this. Prabhupada was always very cordial. Hmm? Tried to get to know the person. So Gorgavinda told him everything, you know, basic things about his life. While they were talking, then the servant came in and said, Prabhupada, is this man disturbing you? Should we throw him out? He said, no, you get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, after some time, he asked Gorgovinda Maharaj, so you are very educated in language. Can you translate my lectures into Hindi? That's why I know that what he, magazine he read was English because they didn't have Hindi at that time. Can you translate my lectures into Hindi? So then he said, yes. So he called the servant. He said, bring me one BTG. So they brought him a BTG and he looked and he said, I want you to translate this lecture into Hindi language. Can you do it? Yes, I can. Told the servant, give him a, one pad, paper, and pencil. There's no computer in those days. <laughs> Everything was pad and 
pen, pen, pen and pencil. So he, they took him in the back in uh, one uh, place to sit. He translated the article and Prabhupada read it. And he said, okay, this is very good. He said, so I want you to translate my articles and my books into Hindi and Oya. And he said, I understand what you want, what you need, so I am going to give you sannyas. And after you take sannyas, I will send you to Orissa to make your own disciples. The Prabhupada understood immediately what was his position. And Gorgovinda Maharaj told me, he said, then I understood he was my guru. Because that was in my heart. I never spoke these things to him. So then I understood, okay, he's Antaryami. He is uh, super soul in the heart. He knows what's going on in my heart. So he, he is the man external manifestation of super soul. So he is my real guru. I can understand it. So then after that, Gorgo, pra, Prabhupada called the servant, told, okay, you shave him up, and give him bath, and give him uh, clothes, some uh, dhoti and kurta and all this, and give him a room to do the translation work. So then he began his devotional life. He started there in Vrindavan. Then Srila Prabhupada told him to come to Bombay because Bombay was the, the Prabhupada used to say Bombay is my place of business. Mm -hmm. So the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust was in Bombay. That's where it was headquartered for Indian, the Indian Trust. He had one trust in America and he had one in India. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that Bhaktivedanta book trust, so then he called Gorgovinda to come. At that time, I was in Bombay. So that time I met with uh, him. That's how I met him the first time in Bombay. So I saw him, I saw he was very quiet. He was very serious. He was doing his work in the translation work, and when he wasn't doing translation work, he was doing menial task. He was cleaning the pots and uh, sweeping and mopping and doing, you know, menial labor with no, no uh, uh, ego. Ego. Huh? Remorse. Not, not remorse. No, no. Ego. No hesitation. No. He was completely enthusiastic about it. He had a no, hesitation. no. Uh, Apprehension. Apprehension, yes, to do the service. And uh, whenever he wasn't doing either any service, he was chanting. He was always doing his job, chanting, chanting, chanting. He would just stand in the on the in the mandap, the dance uh, platform, in front of the deities and chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, do all day long chanting. And uh, then I, I didn't know what to make of him. I didn't understand. I just, you know, he was very different from me. <laughs> but uh, one day I was sitting in the room with the Srila Prabhupada. Then uh, Gargamuni came in the room. And he was talking with Prabhupada and he said, you know that boy over there in the book trust? Prabhupada said, what boy? He said, you know, Gopal. Gopal? He's not a boy. He's old enough to be your father. Boy. Don't call him boy. Then I could understand that Prabhupada wanted us to give some respect to him, that he was a senior person. 
So then after that, uh, I was very respectful toward him because I understood that the Prabhupada wanted us to be respectful to him. Then after that, they moved the people who were doing the translation work to Mayapur. So he went to Mayapur. In Bombay, after two months of being a devotee, he got Harinam from Prabhupada. Prabhupada gave him Harinam, and that's where he took Harinam in Bombay. And then he went to Mayapur, and after two months he took Diksha, Brahman Diksha. So within four months he got all the... Usually we waited six months or a year to get... It, it took me a year and four months before I got Harinam. It took a long time in those days. Of course, Prabhupada was away for over a year in India, so that was part of the reason why I was delayed so long, but yeah, like that. So then we came to, I had a, a little traveling party that we were going everywhere preaching. And we came from Bombay to Mayapur for the festival in 1975. For the Mayapur festival. So we came there for the Mayapur festival. And uh, that year there were three festivals. One was in Mayapur. Then one was in Hyderabad. And then one was in Vrindavan. Three festivals. the one in Vrindavan was the opening of the temple. The one in Mayapur and the one in uh, Hyderabad was also a temple opening. There was two temple openings. So when I was in Calcutta Vargamuni asked me to arrange Prabhupada wanted that all the devotees from Mayapur should go to Hyderabad. So I arranged for two cars on the train that we had control of those two cars. Only our devotees were on those cars. So I always used to do things like this. This was, I had, it was easy for me to deal with government people. I got them to do whatever they wanted. Anyway, then I'm up there in Mayapur and Prabhupada calls me up to his room one day. So I go to the room. Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj is sitting in the room. So there was a man named Nityananda Konungo. And his daughter was named Chubby Kanungo. Nityananda Kanungo was a very important politician in India. He had studied Russian language. And he was the deputy secretary of state or defense, something of that nature. A very high-ranking official in the central government with Jawaharlal Nehru. So when Khrushchev came to visit India because he spoke, this Konungo spoke Russian, he was the person to take Khrushchev around everywhere and talk with him and show him, well, this is this, this is this, because he could explain in the Russian language. Very important person in politics and society. So his daughter had some land so she wanted to donate that land to ISKCON to make a temple. So there was a road that came from South India all the way to Calcutta. It was called Highway Number 5. <laughs> and that road, on one side, there was a village. It was a cowherd village where the cows 
people, all the people, the farmers, the people who lived in that village had cows and they grew some rice and wheat and whatever. And on the other side was a jungle. I mean literally a jungle. When I was there with Gorgo Indomaraj, we I saw a wild boar, a big animal like this, with a tusk, and a big snake. <laughs> it was rainy season, and I was standing on the the concrete slab. The concrete slab had this uh, like a veranda, a small veranda about this wide, like one yard or one, you know, three feet. So I was standing on the veranda, looking out because you just had to stay in the hut the whole day because of the rain. It was pouring and pouring and pouring rain, rainy season. So when I'm standing there on the veranda and I'm chanting, just trying to get some air, this big snake, I, the thing was huge. It must have been 10, 12 feet long, black came out from underneath the concrete slab, it came out. <laughs> so I said, Maharaj, <laughs> this big snake came out, he was underneath the temple, underneath the uh, hut. He was completely unfazed. Yes, he lives here also. <laughs> yes. So then, Chubby Kanungo gave us this land. It was on the side where the jungle was. Just nothing there, nothing. Just trees and uh, some open land and shrubs, a lot of like shrubbery and bushes. And some fruit trees, some wild trees, different trees. They were here and there, here and there, all over, everywhere. So, it was nothing, it was just empty. So she gave us two biggas, which was like one acre of land. Hmm. So then, what we did, We, Prabhupada called Gaur Govinda before I came, he had called Gaur Govinda up. So he told Gaur Govinda that she has given this land, I want you to go there and make one project, build a temple. So he said, well, I need some assistance. Can you give me some American brahmacharya? So Prabhupada called me. He explained to me what was going on and that I should go in there and preach for the Bhagavad Gita. So this is how we became partners. <laughs> so I went down there and I had like six, seven brahmacharis with me. So we went out to do Sankirtan. Nobody spoke. English or Hindi. They only spoke Oriya. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had no, only English magazines. There was very few Hindi pieces of literature and the few pieces we had, which he had translated, uh, were not understandable by anyone in Orissa. Orissa at that time was poor and ignorant. <laughs> so. There was no communication. People didn't speak English. People didn't speak Hindi. They didn't understand what we were doing or who we were. We couldn't communicate. We couldn't sell any literature. And so I had a, a treasury of money, which I had collected from my previous Sankirtan trips. And every day I was buying the what do you call, uh, paying for the room. We were staying in a Goshala. Uh, not a Goshala. Uh, 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 Dharmashala. Huh? Dharmashala. Dharmashala. 
We were staying in the Dharma Shala in Old Town, in the Old Town. We were staying in the Dharma Shala. It was just like two rupees a day for each of us. And we were eating the Ananta Vasudev Prashad. Ananta Vasudev is it's like Jagannath Baldev Subhadra there in Bhubaneswar. And after his, after they offer the Prashad to Ananta Vasudev, then the Prashad is brought to uh, Shiva, to the Bhubaneswar temple, and offered to Lord Shiva, the Shiva Lingam there. He eats Krishna's Prashad. So we were eating the prasad of Ananta Vasudev. So we were sitting there, and every day the money was running out. I went with Gorgovinda Maharaj to see the land. It took us an hour because we, <laughs> we had to take a rickshaw. So it took us an hour to get from Old Town way out to this place. It was so far, and I thought, what? What are we doing here? It's a jungle. There's nothing here. How can we, how will you preach? How will you, you know, I just, for me, it, I was a young, I was 24, 25. I had no understanding of how to deal with it. So I sat with him one day and I said, we're in serious trouble, you understand? that we have no place to go and we have no money and we have no way to make any money. No one is, we're going on Sankirtan and nobody's giving us any money and we have no books to sell and no magazines and nothing. What will we do? So I got very concerned. Then I remembered that train is coming with the two cars. It's coming on such a, because I had organized it that's coming from Calcutta to Hyderabad and it will stop in Bhuvaneshwar. So I will get on that train with the devotees and we'll go. So at that time, I explained to him what my plan was. He said, I'm not going. Prabhupada told me to stay here, I'm staying here. So I looked at him and I said, well, you know, because first of all, I didn't, I didn't really understand properly. You know, I was too immature. I said, well, you're a brahmachari. You can't stay here by yourself. You have to be a sannyasi to stay by yourself. Oh, he wasn't already a sannyasi? No, no. This is how he becomes a sannyasi. Uh, I, I, was, I was thinking he was a sannyasi because he got it right away, so quick. Huh? I guess, yeah. The time was... Yeah, yeah. It, it, now we're at about uh, six months he's been a devotee. So we go to Hyderabad and Prabhupada sees us there. What are you doing here? He said, come to my room tomorrow morning. So we came the next morning. I explained to him all the problems. How I, I'm going on Sankirtan. There's no books. Nobody's buying any books. We can't communicate. They don't speak Hindi. They don't speak English. And I just gave him a litany of all the problems. And he was like shaking his head like, he doesn't understand the challenge. I just gave him this challenge to make something work in a difficult situation and he didn't know how to deal with it. So he was not so pleased with me by that. Then, then, uh, Gorgo Vindamara said, Shiva Prabhupada, I want to take sannyas. Can you give me sannyas? Because he wanted to go back by himself. So he tells Prabhupada was very is very interesting because Prabhupada's sitting there, it's the morning before his breakfast. It's just after the morning walk. And all the big shots, the GBCs and sannyasis, they're all sitting in the room. So Prabhupada doesn't want to argue with everybody. He knows that if I say yes, then there's going to be an argument. So he didn't say any, he didn't say that. He turned and he said, do you know what it means to take sannyas? Let me tell you what it means to take sannyas. First of all, 
There should be no more sex desire. Secondly, there should be no fear. And the third, you should understand that Krishna is always with you. These are the three things. Then you can take sanyasa. And then Prabhupada looked at him and he said, Do you understand? And Sri Gurgavinda Maharaj looked at him and said, Yes, I understand. And Prabhupada then, just, it was like some kind of a movie. Prabhupada finished saying that, Gurgavinda said that. Then the, the, the servant came in with the plate of breakfast prasad, put it on Prabhupada's table, and that was it. The, the morning discussion was over. So then I remember I went into the secretary's room with all the big shots to hear what they had to say, and they were saying, oh, Prabhupada didn't answer the question. He asked if he could take sannyas, and Prabhupada didn't say if he could or he couldn't. He just he asked him if he knew what it meant to take sannyas, and he explained that he didn't say yes or no. Like nobody knew what was going on, which was exactly what Prabhupada wanted. He, didn't, he wanted to obfuscate what his idea, what his uh, intentions were. <laughs> so then, when we get to Vrindavan, uh, one of my god brothers, Tripurari, was going to take sannyas. So because he was going to take sannyas, then he was getting everything ready. And I walk into the room, and Mahamsa Maharaj from Hyderabad is helping Gorgovinda Maharaj make his danda. So I asked him, what are you doing? He said, Prabhupada said I could take sannyas. So I was looking at him, I said, he, he didn't say yes, but he said, Prabhupada said I could take sannyas. He knew. I didn't understand. I left the room and I was thinking, I don't understand. <laughs> What's going on? So he told me later that when Prabhupada gave him the danda, that Prabhupada said to him, you have understood. It was between the two of them. They were, very, they were old, intimate associates. And the Prabhupada and Gorgovinda Maharaj could communicate with each other just by a glance, just by... Uh, their intuition, their consciousness. It was beyond the capacity of us children, because that's what we were, we were children, uh, to understand what Prabhupada was doing and what Gorgovinda Maharaj was doing. But of course, after he takes sannyas, then everybody goes in and starts shouting, why don't you give me a brand new man? He's a brand new man. <laughs> Because by this time, he'd only been about seven months a devotee. The Prabhupada said, you are brand new men. He is a pure devotee from birth. So, then I joined Gargamuni's book distribution party and I told him, Prabhupada wanted me to go to Arisa, so I want to I want Arisa to be my territory for distributing books to the libraries in Arisa. And so I did that. And I was communicating with Gorgon Maharaj and I was making arrangements with a lot of important people, uh, ministers, the Speaker of the House of Representatives for the state of Orissa the deputy chief minister, different people I met, and some businessmen who were, I met a man, you know these metal suitcases that they make, the metal trunks? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I met, I knew a guy who made that, he had a factory, he made all these trunks. So like this, I met all these people. So, when Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada came, I went there, from uh, Allahabad, from Prayag. No more Allahabad. Allahabad is over. Yogi Nath changed the name back to Prayag. <laughs> so, uh, so we were in Prayag, and after the festival in Prayag, 
There was an interesting conversation that Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj had with Srila Prabhupada and Prayag. In that conversation, Gorgovinda Maharaj admitted to him that when I'm translating your books, he said, so then I'm doing the word for word. He said, and then I'm trying to write the verse. He said, if I do the verse literally from word to word, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't seem to convey what you are saying in the English language. So I adjusted a little bit to express what you mean in the Aurea language. He said, but then I was feeling guilty that I'm changing your words or I'm making some mistakes. So what is your opinion? Prabhupada said, I am also doing it. He said, the Sanskrit into the English, he said, sometimes I cannot make it exact but I understand the meaning of what's being done, what's being said. And so understanding the meaning of what's being said, I express it in the English language as I know how to do it. So this was an important conversation that they had there in Prague. So then I came to Bhubaneswar. Prabhupada was staying in a, they had built a hut it was a concrete slab and then the walls were made of mud and brick and the roof was made of thatch. And outside they had these thick bamboo mats and the thick bamboo mats uh, covered one slab where there was a shower and then there was this two, there was another slab with uh, two toilets. One was a squat toilet that the devotees used, and one was a sitting toilet because Prabhupada couldn't squat anymore. He had to sit. So, uh, that was where he was living. So, I started bringing people to see him. I brought the Speaker of the House, I brought the Deputy Minister, I brought the guy who ran the, who made the trunks and everything. So they were, all, they, they were looking at him, why are you living here? No, don't stay here. I, I have uh, control over all the biggest guest houses in Bhuvaneshwar. I'll give you a, a palace to stay in. Baba said, no. Krishna has given me, this is the room Krishna has given me to stay. I will live here. So they were all flabbergasted. They had never seen anyone with that kind of dedication and renunciation. The man who owned the trunk factory, when he came out from the room, he said to me, I have seen your magazine. I know all the palatial buildings that he has all over the world, but yet he is sitting here in this mud hut like a true sadhu. He is a real sadhu, I can understand. So like this, Prabhupada impressed them very much. So everyone was getting, Prabhupada said they were going to build a temple there. Prabhupada told that uh, the, the devotees were all complaining, why are you building a temple here? It's in the middle of all the arguments that I had already given Prabhupada. <laughs> it's in the middle of the jungle. It's nowhere. Nobody's here. Everybody lives in town. We should just build something in Puri. Prabhupada said, you don't know anything. <laughs> He said, someday, this temple is going to be in the center of the city. And that's exactly what happened. They built the, the other half of Bhubaneswar in that jungle. <laughs> and so, highway number five became the center of the city, and the temple is right on highway number five. So Prabhupada said it will be the center of the city. He said, and then he said, and people will come from all over the world to be at this temple which happened because he was initiating disciples everywhere, all over the world, and they were coming. So, then, we were getting ready to leave. Prabhupada was going to leave, I 
think the next day and the day after. So Borgovinda Maharaj said, I need help. I can't do this by myself. I need some assistance. <laughs> so Prabhupada, he says, bring me the fat one. <laughs> so I came in the room. Yes, Sri Prabhupada. So, he started calling me Bhagavad Maharaj. He said, so Bhagavad Maharaj. <laughs> Um, now I'm like nervous, you know, why is it going to be Papa? So he says, uh, Sri Gorgovinda Maharaj is going to stay here and develop this project and he needs some help. So I want to make you the co-director of this project. So I said, well, I said, uh, Sri Prabhupada, Garga Muni, is the GBC here, and he and I don't get along very well anymore. He said, that's okay. I officially removed Gargamuni. Now you are, <laughs> you are in charge of Marissa. <laughs> so, so I go, okay, the first argument is gone. <laughs> so I said, but, but Adi Keshav had just sent me, I had just gotten a letter that day that he called me in from Adi Keshav. They were going to make me the Bhakta leader in New York. So I said, but Adi Keshav just sent me a letter and I'm going to be the Bhakta leader in New York. Ah, oh, there's so many devotees in New York. We don't need anyone else in New York. Oh, uh, but Prabhupada, uh, <laughs> I was like trying to get out of this thing. I'm not chanting all my rounds. Yes. <laughs> I understand, but I see that you work very hard. Sometimes when you work hard, you don't finish all your rounds. It's okay. He said, you can finish them later. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm like completely defeated. I have nowhere to go with this. <laughs> yeah. So I understood. He wants me to be here. This is it. This is what he wants. So I said, okay, sure, Papa. Yasya Prasada, Bhagavat Prasada, Yasya Prasada, Nandati Gatoki. He smiled. So oh, very good. Very good. You have understood this. So, Bhagavat Maharaj, you want to take sannyas? <laughs> wow. So I said, Papa, you know, I'm 26 years old at this time, and I had seen so many of my god brothers take sannyas and fall down. So I was not so eager, excited to do that because I knew I was still a lusty young boy. So I said, well, Prabhupada, I don't know if uh, someday I'd like to take sannyas, but I don't think I'm ready to take sannyas right now in the future. Oh, he said, that's very good. I'm very happy to hear that. That means you understand how serious it is. He said, okay, since you understand how serious it is, whenever you think you're ready, then you can take sannyas. You decide. So like that, Prabhupada, we had this communication. So that's when I ended up staying there with Srila Govinda Maharaj, and the two of us worked together. And living with him was amazing. I, 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 one of the services I did was help him to get Prabhupada's books printed. He was doing the translation work. This is BC, before computers. We have no computers. So he would get, you know, like a, like a one rupee uh, a book, you know, a lined book that a kid would use in school. What do they call them? A composition book or something like that? Yeah, that's what we used to call them in school, composition book. Like a notebook? Notebook, yeah. So, and pencils. And he was writing. He was reading, Prabhupada, and he would write, translate the book. His dedication completely... You can't even estimate the level of devotion and dedication he had. 
From early in the morning when he got up, he was chanting. Then he would recite all these prayers. He had like a whole ritual. Okay, and I've done Japa. Now I go to Mangal Arti. Now I come back. Now I recite these prayers. Now I write in my diary. Now I do translation work. Uh, you know, like he had a list and he did the same thing every day. And if he didn't complete all of his tasks, he wouldn't eat. Only until he finished all the tasks would he eat his pajama. I've seen him some days. He was a little late in doing it. And uh, they would come with breakfast and say, no, I can't eat now, I have to finish. He was very dedicated to this. Do, uh, discipline. This, his discipline was very strong. So he would translate the book uh, into, and first what I, he asked me, <laughs> he was so kind, he said, which book should I translate? So I said, well, to go out on Sankirtan, I need small books for one rupee, something I can sell for one rupee, two rupees in Oriya. So he said, okay. So he did like uh, topmost yoga, uh, these like those little tiny books that we had in English. He would translate them, and um, so after he would translate it, so then I would bring the uh, the book to the printer, and we used this one printer, Janaki Balapatnayak. He was with the Congress party, Indira Gandhi's party, and he was a friend of Prabhupada from the time when the Congress party was in power in Delhi. He used to come and see Prabhupada. I think he was the deputy minister of the deputy minister of defense or something like that. He had an important position in government, like Nityananda Kananda. So, uh, and his family had a printing press in Katak, which was the next, was the big city over. So I would bring the paper, the, the, the book to him. So in those days, they had, uh, not a, what is it, a block, block printing. But block printing means that they would read the page and then they would get, they had all these little, little, uh, they were like square pegs, okay? And they had a box. And into, into the box, they would put the pegs. Each peg was an, a letter from the alphabet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they would write it backwards because when it was printed, it had to come out the, the other way. So they would fill, the, you know, they would, they would do like a few pages and make one impression. And I, I couldn't stay, you know, it took them time. It took them a couple of days to get that part of it done. Then he would call me. Okay, the impression is done. So then I would go there and get the impression. I would bring it back for the Linda Mars would read it and edit it. Uh, this is wrong. This is right. This is wrong. This is right. Then I would bring it back. They'd make another impression. Then I would come back, give him that impression. He'd say, okay, this is okay. Then like this, the whole book was done impression by impression. That was only the half of it. Yeah. Just getting just getting the impressions ready. Now we had to get paper. This was during Indira Gandhi's, you know, martial law emergency control of the country where you couldn't buy anything. I couldn't buy paper. I couldn't go to a store and say, or a factory and say, I need a hundred reams of paper to print a book. I'd say, no. 
you had to apply to the government. And the only people who could apply to the government and get paper were the, were the newspapers, book publishers, and religious organizations. And we were a religious organization, so we were able to apply. So I would, I had to fill out all these forms, like a stack of forms, everything by hand. You know, there was like, this is like Indian solar board. So then I'd come in to the office where you have to hand in the papers, right? And there's this big room with like 25 tables of men. Each man has like a little desk, like it's like in school, you know? A small desk table, and the papers are on the table, and they got a big pile in and a pile out, you know? So I come in and I give the papers, and I say, who do I give the papers to? Me. me. Okay, so when, when will I get the papers back? He said, well, I, I, you have to, we have to review them and we'll, we'll get back to you. So I waited a couple of days, I go in. So where are the papers? He said, oh, they're here. I said, well, you haven't finished? He said, well, after I finish doing the first page, then I give it to him, he does the second page. <laughs> <laughs> I give it to him and he does the third page. <laughs> the 20, you know, I had, I had done 25 pages. There was 25 desks in there. <laughs> it was gonna go around the room, you know. This is how laborious things were, you know. So I, there was a guy in the village, he was a younger man and he worked in one of these kind of offices for the government. So I said, what do I do? He said, go upstairs and give a book or two books to the guy who's in charge. He's running the place. And he'll go down and he said, they're, they're waiting for you to give them money, but they can't ask you because you're a foreigner. So the Indians know that they have to give something under the table for the papers to go from one desk to the other. So you have to pay 25 people to get the work done. He said, but if you go upstairs, and give the books to some big shot who runs the place, then he'll come down and tell everybody, just do it. And they'll do it because they know that he got, he got paid somehow. They don't know how to do it. So I went up and at that time, at that time in, in India, there was no such thing as four colored prints of Krishna pictures. Is somebody calling you on the? Okay. There was there was no such thing as four color prints. So because there was no four color prints, when we would give a book to somebody, it was their eyes would fall out of their head. They had never seen the Krishna book or the Gita with all these beautiful four color prints. So it was like gold to get one of these books. So I gave the guy a Krishna book and a Gita, and he was completely happy. So he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So he goes downstairs and he's telling everybody in order, oh, 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 oh. and then everybody, you know, okay, okay. So went right around the desks, and they came back two days later, it was all done. <laughs> So then the truck would come to our address because that I had to give the address of the the hut, but I had no place in the hut for these big piles of paper. I had no place to put the paper. So I would get in the truck and go with them to Katak and deliver the paper to the printer so that the printer could, you know, print the books. And we had no idea if he used all the paper for our books or he used it for something else or I have no idea what he did. <laughs> but that was what we did, you know. And the cost of the the book was enough so that we could sell it for one rupee. And that's how we were able to do Sankirtan. Nice. And we went out to the markets and we three of the devotees would do kirtan and a couple of the devotees would sell the books. Mostly I would do kirtan because I couldn't speak Oriya, so I couldn't communicate. So I said, look, I'll do kirtan. 
and you distribute the books to people, get them to give you a rupee. So this is what was, what we did. And I had to do the same thing with the cement to, to, to put the foundation. I was the one who got all the cement for the, the foundation of that temple. I got all the cement for the foundation of the temple. Then I left after that and had to fight with the GBC. It was another thing which Gorbogina Maharaj warned me not to do, but I didn't listen to him. So uh, anyway, um, so we did the cement the same way, the same thing, the cement. With the upstairs guy and everything like that? Yeah, yeah, the same thing. Well, this time I knew what I had to do right from the beginning. I just took the papers upstairs with the books. I said, here, <laughs> fix this. <laughs> then they came with the truck full of cement. So, but that, the cement we kept there because we used the cement there. And by that time, Chaitanya Semana and Rachi Tambra and Jaya Radhika was there, their daughter. So, um, like this, I would assist Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj in his work. I would help him. And, uh, all these devotees, there's some interesting story. <laughs> One day, we're sitting in the hut. And I hear this, this screaming and yelling at Aurea from the street. I said, who is that? He said, no, don't, don't worry about it. Nah. He would go like this all the time, you know, with his hand. <laughs> so I go outside and I look and I see the face and I immediately understand this is his son because he looks identical to Gorgo and <laughs> And it was his eldest son. So I said, but I asked him anyway, I said, I have a son. Tell him to come home now. He has to be with his wife. He has to take care of his children. What is he doing here? He should leave immediately. Oh, How old is he? Like 18. You know, he was only a few years younger than me. I was 26, 27. He was 18 or 19, I don't remember. So, then Srila Gorgo in the morning, I said, you have to go out there and talk to him because he's upset. But he went out. And the two of them were yelling at each other for like half an hour, and then he, the boy left. So then a few days later, his 14-year-old son came, Abaya. But he was very meek, very humble. So he came, he was standing at the door. You know, and he said, Baba, I want to stay here. No, you can't stay here. You know, they were talking in Orius. I said, what's going on? What's going on? He, he thinks I'm his father. I'm not his father anymore. I'm a sannyasi. He's not my son. I told him to go home, stay with his mother. So, so the kid was crying, you know. He was standing at the door, weeping and weeping. So I said, look at him, he's crying. You can't do this to him. He said, I said, let him stay here. Who's going to take care of him? I said, I'll take care of him. Okay, you're his father now. Okay, you take care of him. <laughs> So I said, okay, I'll be his father. So then I told the boys, you know, because all the boys who were there, they were all his students from before when he was in school teaching. So they had all come to be with him. So so they took him and they, you know, dressed him up and everything. And I watched. He would come every day and offer his obeisances to his father, and his father would ignore him. Ignore him. But he came to every program, every morning, every evening. He chanted job all day long. And after about two or three months, then Guru Govinda Maharaj let up on him a little bit. He said, okay, he's not here just to be, for me to be his father, but he's here to be a devotee. So, okay, I'll, I'll accommodate.
accommodate him. And eventually he gave him Harinam. He got Harinam because so Bhakti, Bhakti Vinod Thakur had given Harinam to Bhakti Siddhanta. So he gave him Harinam. And I'm in touch with him on Facebook. He's on Facebook now, Abhay Mullet Manik. And today when I posted the picture of Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj and I sitting together with all the devotees, and he's kneeling on the ground just in front of Gorgovinda Maharaj. Aww. So I'm telling, I'm, I named all the devotees in the picture. So uh, when I put up his name, then he, it clicked, you know, on his page. So he said, oh, Dandavat Pranams Maharaj, I remember him, he remembers me. So, because I was the one who arranged for him to stay there. So, that was a nice story. I was sometimes very angry because I was frustrated dealing with the Indian people. I couldn't communicate properly and so I would get angry with people about, you know, things that they were doing. And then they would complain. Why are you angry? You're supposed to be a sadhu. You're not a sadhu. Why are you angry? Sadhus don't get angry like this. He would defend me. He would say, oh, he's not a sadhu? He was living in America in a big palace and he came here to live in this hut. He said, you can't even cross the street from your hut to stay in this hut. And you're complaining about him. <laughs> he would shout at them like that. <laughs> he was very kind and compassionate to me. One time I had gone to Bombay to do some things with the book trust. And because in those days, to accomplish things, you had to go in person to like deal with it. You know? There was no internet, email. The phone was terrible. Oh, <laughs> you have to you call an operator. Hello, operator. <laughs> I want to talk to this number. Okay, we'll see if we can connect. <laughs> it's like, it, was, it was a nightmare in India. So. Um, Anyway, uh, when I came back, he's lying on the ground, sick, really sick, very ill. And uh, I said, Maharaj, what happened? He said, while you were gone, Vaishnav Das, Vaishnav Das was the Orison Brahmachari there. He used to take care of the cook meals and stuff. He said, Vaishnav Das left to go and see his somebody or something, whatever, and he, while he was gone, I had to do the puja. I had to bathe the deities. He said, and I left Gornitai unclothed too long and they got a cold. Aww. So they punished me and they gave me a cold. So I said, well, let me take you to my doctor, because I used to go to the, this Ayurvedic doctor there in, in, in Bhuvaneshwar, a very famous doctor. I learned a lot about herbology from him. He told me so many things. No, no, he said, no doctor can cure me. No doctor can cure me. He said, I, I have to suffer. For my Aparad to go in the time. So the only medicine is not. The only medicine is not. And so he recited Nam for hours, every day, every night. Just I would fall asleep to him chanting Nam. I'd wake up, he'd be chanting Nam. All day, all night, chanting, chanting, chanting. And then two days after I had come back, he just got up. He said, are you okay? He says, yes, Gornikai has forgiven me now. So my sickness is done. This was his consciousness. All right, you have to forgive me because I'm getting, there's some other important stories I want to tell. It's a quarter to nine. <laughs> but 
We'll do it tomorrow. Is that all right? Yeah. Nice on this for us tomorrow. Okay. I want to tell about this Bob ecstasy in Mayapur and some other things. Thank you very much for so patiently listening to all the kata about my dear, beloved God, brother, and friend, Shiva Gordon. Thank you.